Let's give Jesus a big hand. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. Um, you're mighty to save, Lord. Um, Lord, your hand is not too short that you can't reach down and save to the, to the uttermost, Lord, those who are in the lowest parts and the lowest places of, of life, Lord. You see fit, Lord, that your love shines through the darkest places, Lord. And we know, Lord, that it's because of your grace and your goodness we're here. This is why we're here, Lord because of your goodness, and we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're kind to us, Lord. We thank you that you're gentle to us, Lord, and you won't break a bruised reed or blow out a, a quenching flax, Lord. You, you know us, Lord. You know that we're limited and we only dust. And we thank you for the grace of God that bringeth salvation and how it appear to all men, Lord. It teaches us, Lord, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we could all live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, Lord. Because we have a hope. We're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who redeemed us from every lawless deed, Lord, and set us aside. You purify us, Lord, for your purpose. We're your zealous people for good works, Lord. We thank you that we're your workmanship, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that your word would be magnified, Lord. Lord, you said that the entirety of your word is truth, Lord, that it makes wise the simple. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, give us wisdom from your word, Lord. Give us understanding, Lord. Give us application, Lord. Give us a hunger for it, Lord. Let it be sown into our hearts that it could bear fruit, some 100 folds, some 60, some 30, but let us bear fruit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I promised to sit this morning, we would look at earlier that those things that hinder us from walking in the spirit, the things that hinder us from being fired up, and the things that sometimes I think we all, you know, get bogged down with too, you know. Just the everyday mundane things of work, schedules, kids, soccer practice, baseball practice, <laughs> you know, the pipes bust and this, you know, and the garden work and pick up the mulch and the honeydew list and all those things. You know, we all have that, you know, uh, and we're here, we're here to labor. You know, God has said that we would labor, you know, but the other part of that, it says that, you know, Christ told the disciples, he says, I will send another. He said, I'll send another, you know, and, and you know, using the word for another is heteros, another of a different kind, but he tells the disciples, I will send you another elos, another of the same kind. And it would be the Holy Spirit that he would come and live in us. He would not only live in us, he'll be with us, he will live in us, live in us. And then at Pentecost, he came upon them. You know, so they were not only filled with the Spirit, the Spirit came upon them too. And and so our lives are lives that are lives that are are, are, are governed by those things that are spiritual in, in the sense that as we yield to them. You know, they're available for us. They all, you know, anything you want to do in the kingdom of God, and, and if God calls you to do it, he can fulfill it. He you begun a good work, he will complete it, you know. And I think that sometimes we don't know how valuable we are to the Lord. Because he could have used anybody to serve. He could have got some horses, you know, and start going street witnessing. <laughs> you know, I mean, he could have got anybody, anything to do it, but he chose human beings. You know, he ch and we created in his image. So there's some love attached that, you know, to this co-laboring in the sense that, that God is doing work, but he uses our hands and feet and our eyes to do it. And I'm just amazed that he would do that. You know, I'm amazed that he would even let us partake in his divine work, that he would allow us to be included in the things that he want to do. And I'm just blown away that God loves us that much that not only does he call us to do the work, but he puts his spirit in us to enable us to do the work. And that's just amazing to me. Then we get to heaven, you throw and you're casting your crowns down. It wasn't us did anything. He did it for us and did it through us. We just given him back what he's given us. And I think that's a privilege. So that's why I'm never tired of it. I might be tired in it, but I'm never tired of it. You know, and I think that 
you know, when you look at, you know, earlier we looked at the flesh, and I, and I hope nobody walked out and said, oh, man, he got me on this one. That's not the intent. The intent that you walk away from things that apply to you that are not fruitful. That's the intent. You know, I was using this analogy a few weeks ago. I was telling John earlier when we were praying, and me, him, and Brian, how, you know, if God gave you a basket right now and said, when you get to heaven, I want this basket to be filled with fruit. When you got there, would it be filled? You know, would you stand before him with an empty basket with nothing in it? I want it to be so filled that as, you know, Peter said he wanted to enter into the kingdom of God with an abundance. I want it to be filled that I can't even lift it. And God says, look at me and look at all of us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful for a few things. I'll make you rule over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want it to be able that the Lord could say, you did it well. You finished well. And all of us should want that. Amen? Amen. That we finished well. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. You know, and we should never be complaining, you know, oh, Lord, this is way too much, and, you know, it's his work and not my work, and if we can't run with the footmen, how can we run with the horses? And so God has called us to run a race and that we would finish well, but we need to be, you know, filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to do it not in our own strength, not in the flesh. We've seen what the, the works of the flesh is. We've seen that. And then uh, it's really a bad place to serve the Lord in the flesh. Oh, you just want to do it because it seemed like it's something good to do? Oh, you think about John Mark when he was with uh, Barnabas and Saul. At that point, they called him Saul Bar and Paul when they were in Pamphylia. And I think John Mark went on that mission trip in the flesh. You know, he said, oh, man, it's a great idea. You going into Paul? I'm going into Paul. <laughs> Go with Steve. Yeah, and get out there and there wasn't no um, Dunkin' Donuts or no. He said, whoa, I didn't know it was like, hey, hey. <laughs> no pizza huts or nothing. He's like, I'm getting out of here. He didn't even tell him when he left. He just left. You know, and so sometimes people can do things and they can do it in the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit produces something different. It produces something that's remarkable, that it affects, you know, people that you may come across. They, you can be a Christian into an unsaved world, and when you walk in the room, it's something different about us. It's something that we can offer the world that nobody else could offer the world. And, and it's, just, it's just go in the world and make disciples. It didn't say stay in the church. It's just go in the world. You know, when you get them, then you teach them and bring them to church. They got to be taught. But this is go in the world and make disciples. And, and you think of yourself and you say, when I walk in the room, what aroma do I bring when I walk in the room? And so Paul tells us, in contrast of all those things that were Evidence of the flesh, you know, all those, that whole list of about 18 things when, when Paul says adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lewdness and idolatry and sorcery, drug use and hatred, contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and dissensions and heresies and envies and murders and drunkenness and rubberies. And he goes through that whole list. And now he says, but... In verse 22. So we'll look at Galatians 5.22 and work our way down. It says, but, and this is in contrast of the work of the flesh, which is evident to those who practice such things. He says, but, it's a conjunction, donating contrast, but the fruit, notice it's not an S behind fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. You know, love, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believe in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Love, God is love. The, the fruit of this spirit is, you know, is love. And you, and, and you think about love, love is the greatest gift. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I become sounding brass or a clinging cymbal and though i have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge and though i have all faith so that i can move, remove mountains but i have not love i am nothing he says and and though i bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though i give my body to be burned but I have not love it profits me nothing Love. He says, love. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. 
And brothers, look, our, our, you know, my heart desires for that men love men, you know, that we love each other as brothers, that we would always never envy one another, we would never be insecure around each other, we could be vulnerable around each other, that we can share our hearts with one another, that we could be able to be in a place where we come in the church setting like this, we're home, we're safe. And when somebody tell you something intimate, it's not something for the gossip mill or anything. It's like, I'm on my knees for my brother. And that's what love does. Love does something so unique. It's just so different than the flesh and the world and, you know, that ungodly trinity we fight against every day, the flesh, the world, and Satan. But love is so opposite of that. You know, love is something that everybody's looking for love. Everybody's looking for love. Everybody's looking for love. Some people don't know how to appropriate it or how to express it, but if the truth be told, everybody is looking for love. Love covers a multitude of sin. You know, everybody is looking for love. And I think when you have some guys around you that love you, man, that's like one of the greatest, you know, uh, um, things that I've experienced, that you got men around you that you know you are, you are together, you love each other. We, you know, I remember when Mike was going through stuff, I would text him, what's going on? And, you know, and, you know say, how are you doing? How's everything doing? What do you need to do? We're praying for you. That, that's love. That's interactive love, where love is an action word. And it's always in action. Love is always in action. And it's not how people love you. It's just love. Some guys get married, and then you hear them say, well, I don't love her no more. What do you mean you don't love her no more? What happened? You said you loved her. You said you, you had wedding vows. You said you loved her. No, I don't love her no more. I just don't love her no more. Well, why? She can cook. She don't clean. Well, you knew that when you was dating that she ain't cook or clean. <laughs> you took her out to dinner every week, and you think she's going to cook and clean? Wow. I think men get they get weird. They think women like cooking and cleaning. They don't like it. We don't like it. We don't like doing the dishes. You, you want to see how much you love your wife? Start doing the dishes. Dishes. He said the fruit of the spirit is love. And then he says joy. This is how you know when somebody's walking in the spirit too. They have joy. They have this sense of joy. That is, joy is not happiness. Happiness is because of happenings. Joy is something that lives within the heart of a man or a woman that knows Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living. How you know that you're a Christian is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. That's how you know you're a Christian. And this is the, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and then is peace. You know, Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 57, 21, and Isaiah 48, 22, if I'm not mistaken. It says, there is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. We are the only people in the world that have peace. Do y'all realize that? The world don't have peace. Before I didn't know Christ, I didn't have any peace. Because you always wanted to do something devious. So you're going to this place and that place. And, you know, and the Lord would try to stop you from going there and break your muffler down. And you, got, and you, you still, you know, I'm still going to the party with the muffler. It's not like a motor. like a, you know, still trying to get to somewhere because I have no peace, you know. You couldn't stop me from going where I wanted to go. I was real stubborn, you know. Oh, I'm going. I don't care how I get there. It's all right. The, the, the bus broke down. All right, good. I'll walk. I don't care, but I'm going. And then if I got there and I walked and it was closed, I said, well, I'll wait. I'll come back tomorrow, but I'm going. Just persistent. And you know how persistent we were with the things of the flesh? And then we come serving the Lord, and, he, and now he gets put something in us, and we want to just serve him because we love him, and we, and, he, and we love other people, and there's a joy, and there's a peace that you come in with. You know, this is, you, know you, you have this peace, but this peace is not like a peace where when things go wrong, you still lose it. This peace is a peace that surpasses all understanding. You know, this is not a peace if you get laid off, they give you the pink slip, you know, and the, the, the sinners, they get the pink slip, they go, I'll be back at the job. Oh, I'll fix them. I'll be back. Oh, yeah, I'll fix that boss who laid me off. No, that's not that kind of peace. You sitting there when everybody's going crazy, you up there with sitting on praise the Lord. God's going to do something wonderful. You're not flipping out like the, everybody else at the workplace. Or may, I don't know. Maybe you might be, but I'm hoping you're not. You know, you know, I don't believe they laid me off. I've been given this job all my life. Look what they did to me. 
And then you say, well, you want to come to my church on friends and family today? They say, no, thank you. No, thank you. Not your church. <laughs> what, they teaching y'all martial arts down there or something? You know, you mad with the whole world. And no, but that's not the Christian peace that Paul is talking about here. He says this peace that we have, circumstances doesn't even matter. Because the Prince of Peace is our Lord. And we know that the peace we have, the world didn't give it to us and the world can't take it away. So this is a different kind of peace. This is not the peace that the world calls peace. Like, you know, let's sign a peace treaty. And you know they got the nuclear weapons pointed at each other. And they say, oh, it's a peace treaty, yeah. But this is a peace that the world knows nothing about. That when a doctor gives you a diagnosis, you say, oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. Use it for your glory, Lord. Use it for your glory. Or your wife wake up and say, I don't want you no more. Praise the Lord. No, you say, oh, Lord, <laughs> Lord, you understand, Lord. You understand. <laughs> oh, Lord, is a peace. <laughs> Take that off the tape. No. <laughs> but it's a real peace, you know. And then this is long-suffering. I like what the NIV says, forbearance, kindness, notice joy, I mean goodness, then it's faithfulness, gentleness, which is meekness, self-control or temperance against such there is no law. There's no law. And then he says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions, with its longings and, and desires, you know, uh, uh, something that you're passionate about and uh, lusting after. You know, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. That Jesus said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not, no, I'm not doing, I can't do that. You, no way. You know, well, you want to come to um, somebody at your job, they just got promoted, say, come on, meet me at such and such, and it's happy hour. You just come, oh, no, I, you go happy hour you want to, I can't come there. No, no, no. I, I have joy. I have peace. I don't need nothing to make me have this anesthetized, you know, sense of peace. And no, no, I have peace with God. I have joy. I have love. I don't need some, you know, some to go to the wine and spirit store to make me have a joy or a peace because I've crucified that stuff. That was the old man. That's who I used to be. The old man. I took the old man. And you know what I did the old man? I took the old man and I threw him in the dumpster. And they, you know, they, I threw him in a dumpster. I, no longer does that old man exist. I threw him in a dumpster. It's the spirit man that's living down the flesh man. Every day I take him and I just throw him right in the trash. He's no, no, I don't know him. Say, what, don't you remember? I don't remember nothing. Don't you know how you used to, I don't know how I used to be. I don't, no, I'm walking in the spirit now. It's a different day for me. It's a new era. When we came to Christ, our life have been ushered into a new era. That we're no longer in bondage or like in a sense of being in like Egypt. We're no longer in Egypt. Sometimes we think we're in Egypt or we start, you know, bringing back stuff how it used to be like the children of Israel did in Numbers chapter 11 when they're talking about, oh, remember when we ate the cucumbers and leeks and garlic and all and fish freely and all, but they didn't, that's a combination of a real bad breath too. But they, you know, but they didn't think about all their wives getting whipped and raped and things was happening and they, they just talk about, you know, Satan only show you one side of it. I don't want to remember it. And some Christians sometimes say, well, you know, it was better when I was in the world than being a Christian. That's just the biggest lie in the world. It was never better. Or waking up with a hangover and a headache, and that was never better than waking up tired from serving the Lord. Never was it better. And he says, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. You know, but to crucify the flesh, that can only be accomplished, as we looked at earlier in verse 16, when it says, I say then walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the only way it can happen. And then he says, if, and this is a big if, if always remind me, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If, so if the works of the flesh are evident in our lives, then it is quite obvious that we have not subjected ourselves to God's authority and the Spirit of God. So our walk will be shaky. You have a shaky walk. 
You often hear people say, well, you know, I'm not getting fed at that church. I'm not getting fed. What do they mean by that? Or is this, that place, nobody there loves me. There's no love there. What do they really mean by that? Because when you are spirit filled, you know, when you walk in the door, you bring those things. You bring love. You bring a heart for God's word. You bring, you know, kindness and gentleness. And you know how to make friends. You're not looking for somebody to make a friend with you. You're looking to make friends with others. And he says, if we, Paul includes himself here, live in the spirit. He says, when we rely on the spirit to sustain us and, and we are yielded to him, then we can live in the spirit, you know, though he's already living within us, but he can use us and he can have full residence in our life. You don't get more of the Holy Spirit the minute you get saved. You got to surrender more of you to the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, now you got to surrender your life to him. You got to surrender your whole life to the Holy Spirit. Your whole life got to say, Lord, I am yours. Do whatever you want to do the way you want to do it. You know, I have guys tell me sometime I'm called to ministry. And I say, well, what does that really mean? What do you mean call? Called to what? I said, the first calling is to do whatever God tells you to do. And then obey him after you figure that out. And then the second calling is whatever he say, do, do it. You know, just do it. Don't, you know, you know I'm, and some people come with a modular home of ministry. It's already figured all out. You know, I'm going to do this, bam, 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 bam. It don't work like that. Because you got to walk in the spirit. You, it's a spiritual walk. It's a journey. It's not complete until you walk in it. You don't complete it before you walk through it and in it. And he says that if we live in the spirit, let us also walk. Now, this is not the same word for walk as in verse 16. This is a different word because this word means to be in the same row, to walk in the same row, to walk by rule and strict accordance to a particular pace, to stride together, walk in cadence and or keep in step. This is what this word means, that also let us walk in step with the Spirit. Wherever the Spirit is taking you, following them, you're walking right behind them. You're not going ahead of God's, you know, plan for your life. You're not doing any of that. You're just walking in step. You're just walking. You're like a military almost when the guys walking and they marching and they, and they walk. I love to see the military and they marching and they stepping and they all stepping. And, you know, if somebody get on a line, they... 50 push-ups, and so everybody's walking straight because they don't want to do the push-ups. And you just walk in, and he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, that we should line our lives up with the direction that the Spirit is taking us, regardless of how we feel. Regardless of how we feel. How many people feel like getting up and going to church every Sunday morning when it's cloudy and there's a football game on? And the eagles are playing. <laughs> the good eagles, not the bad eagles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every Sunday morning, we pastors, every Sunday morning, I love to come to church, but some Sunday mornings I'm like, wow, woo, man, this would be nice um, just to go a little later maybe or, or sleep in a little bit maybe, you know, and then listen to Charles Stanley. And I went, you know, but that's not what God called us to do. It says, forsake, forsake not the gathering of the saints, that we should be together. We should encourage one another. As it says in Hebrews um, chapter 3, we should be exhorting one another. And, and our lives should be lives as though we should love to be, we should love to see each other. And the Spirit would never direct us away from that fellowship. The Spirit of God would never direct us from the things that wouldn't bring us to the body and be a part of the body. It would never do that. That is not the Holy Spirit. He would never do that. He would never say, isolate yourself away, away, away from the body of Christ. He would never say that. And sometimes I've seen guys, they isolate themselves, and I'm saying, no, that's not God. God, in one verse, I like it, says this, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. You know, God would never call any of us sitting here not to be together. Because the early church, they said they were on one accord. And that's because the Spirit of God kept them in, in step with the things of God. He kept them in step. And they were fired up. 
They were. You imagine when? Imagine if they, you know, somebody threatened them. You, you guys come preaching now in this temple precinct. You guys are going to jail. And they went right then and started preaching. They arrested them. And the church prayed in Acts 4. They didn't pray, Lord, oh, Lord, please let Peter and them get out of jail safe, Lord. They said, Lord, give us more, grant us more boldness. Grant us more boldness. That we would be bold for the Lord. We need more men fired up for Jesus. You know, fired up. And I know y'all had lunch and y'all some of y'all ate the pork and some of y'all here like this. <sighs> <sighs> You help me, you know, I gotta get, you know, I know it. Because I'm looking at some of y'all. You know, and you look at that and you start thinking, you say, wow, you know, that's fire. You know, you know, in Rome, if you got caught sleep on the job, you know what they would do to the Roman soldiers? They set them on fire. So if anybody fall asleep, then we got a guy walking around with a little torch. And you'll be fired up. <laughs> You'll be fired up, all right. <laughs> but the early church, they were fired up. They were on fire for the Lord. They were not afraid of what was going on. They didn't lose their peace because of circumstances. They didn't look around wondering what was next. They knew it was next. Follow the Lord. That was it. That was it. What is your blueprint for ministry? Follow Jesus. That's the only blueprint you need. That was it. And Paul says, look, if we live in the Spirit, but if you don't live in the Spirit, you can't walk in the Spirit. But he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, 1 John um, 2, 6 is, if, you know, if we claim to be in Christ, we ought to walk as he walked, past tense. That we should follow Christ with our whole hearts. And that's not religion or just coming to church. That is relationship. That is a genuine say, Lord Jesus, I love you, Lord, because you first loved me. That's why I love you. And you saved me. Look, I'm so thankful for being saved. I got saved October the 4th, 1996. I got saved in a club called Club Vegas. I was Gary signed a record deal with Virgin Records. And the Lord of the universe somehow seen it fit to intervene and met me right at this club. I'm in the club, it's me, my brother, and one of my friends, they're at the pool table, I'm in the middle of the dance floor, just standing around, and the Lord just showed me, this is what you want for the rest of your life? Money and fame and cars and girls and good times, this is what you want for the rest of your life? And I just wept in the club. I, nobody witnessed to me, nobody said, here's a track, no, Jesus wanted me. And I said, Lord, if you're real, I'll follow you until I die. I don't care what it looks like. I don't have to have a fancy church. I don't have anything. I don't need any resources, Lord. I just want you and everything else, Lord, will fall in line. And I realize, you know, and it's been 18 years. And I can look back and say, the Lord has not failed me not one time. He's always been faithful to me. And he's always been good to me. And I know he loves me. If nobody else loves me, I know Jesus loves me. I know he cares for me. And I know he cares for you guys too. Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he said, that's why I want you to walk. He said, I don't want you to walk in the spirit. I want you to have a walk with me. Because when you're close to me, you'll resemble me. And you can impact a world like me. He says, these, remember they had the fishermen? It's, oh, these are, these are the men who had been with Jesus. Unlearned, ignorant men who had been with Jesus. They had it all wrong. They were still with Jesus. That's why they were able to do the things they were doing. If somebody called me ignorant and unlearned and I have been with Jesus, that's a compliment because Jesus is involved. He just needs one man to say, here I am, Lord, I'm yours. That's all he needs. One man. One person can change. You look at young Josiah. He was eight years old and he became king. Eight years old. At the age of 16, he started seeking the Lord. And by 20 and by 26, he finished his whole campaign. And the whole nation of Judah was reformed because of one kid. You don't think the Lord could use you that way? You don't have to go to cemetery. I mean seminary. <laughs> I mean, you know, he can use you. And if you went to seminary, he can use you too. 
He'll use whatever he needs to use. He just needs somebody willing. But he needs somebody just fired up. Somebody so fired up and says, I know I'm, I'm mad about the sin in this nation. I'm, I'm upset. Lord, use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I am not satisfied how this world is going, Lord. Lord, you use me, Lord. Use me in legislation, Lord, if I'm in, in some type of, you know, you know, place where I can have a voice there, Lord. Use me, Lord, if I'm a medical doctor, Lord, where we can stop abortions, Lord. Use me, Lord, in some spectrum or some venue, Lord, that your light would be made known to a lost and dying world, Lord. Use me, Lord. Have me on fire for you. That when people see me, they see you, Lord. And that's what God want to do in all of our hearts. That we should leave out here today, we should say, charge, you know, and people looking at what happened uh, yesterday. My husband came home, he's lost his mind. He's doing the dishes, now he's doing the lawn. Now he says, oh, we're going street witnessing. Oh, we praying together, honey, baby, let's pray together. And look, men should pray with their wives every day. Every day, me and Charlene, we pray together every morning. That's my wife's name, so. <laughs> But we pray together every day. Y'all looking like, well, who is Charlene? <laughs> you know, we pray together every day. And I asked, I said, what's your prayer request, sweetie? You got anything cooking in your heart? You know, it keeps peace in your house. You know what's cooking in your wife's heart? You can pray for her through the day and call her in the middle of the day and see how she's doing. What do you want? I don't want nothing. I just want to see how you're doing. I try to do that every day. Because my first ministry is serving the Lord, obeying the Lord, and then my wife, and then my son, and then any other children I have that's in my vicinity that God has given me as sons. And he says, look, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We should line our lives up with, with, with direction the Spirit is going. We should line our lives up with that. Let us not be, become conceited, provoking one another, envying one, one another. We shouldn't be envious of one another. We should be happy for one another all the time. Because we're one body. And in chapter 6, it was no chapter break here. It says, brethren, I like this. Verse 1, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, those who are living and walking in the spirit are those who are spiritual. Restore, and the word restore means to fit together or to, um, to fit in such a way to adjust, to, to make it function again in a sense, to set in place. He says, restore such a one, notice, in the spirit of gentleness or meekness not this stuff you better get it together boy you know messed your life up not that kind of stuff he was coming to church two weeks straight he was doing good and look at him a mess that's not brotherly love because when we are gentle and meek towards the brethren we exemplify the character of christ because remember when Christ said, when he gave his autobiography of himself, he says, come unto me, all you who labor in the heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am meek or gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's how we should restore our brother. You see a brother you didn't see in a while at church, when you see him, you don't look him in the eyes, look him down like you're ready to have a boxing match. I'm looking at him and trying to get close enough to smell something. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I know where you've been at, buddy. I know where you've been at. Repent, brother! No, you don't do that. You restore. And hopefully they'll be reconciled back into the body. That's spiritualness to me. That you could see somebody where they went astray and you just love them so much. Like a lost sheep. And you somehow in a position to shepherd their hearts in a sense. And bring them back to the fold a spirit of meekness gentleness and you say you know what thank you Lord for using me because it could be me it could be me next Lord and then it says look 
considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, you know, bear one another's burdens, carry the, carry the load for one another. You know, there used to be an old song they used to sing when we were kids, we are soldiers in the army, we have to fight, although we have to die. And it says, we have to hold up the bloodstained banner. You know, and it was about, we are soldiers in the army together. All of us sit there. We in this thing together, whether you want to be related to me or not. I know I'm black. Yup. You might not want to be my brother. <laughs> You're stuck with me, you know? And, and, and that's okay. We all brothers in the Lord. When we get to heaven, I'm sure everybody's going to have the same color when they get there, too. Every tongue and kindred around the throne of God. It's going to be all different kinds. God is into diversity. Diversity can make, diversity should bring unity. Not opposition, unity. God knows what he's doing when he made us all different. Because he was teaching us how to love one another. He says, bear one another burdens. You know, Romans says that in Romans 15, it says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves, let each one please his neighbor for good, leading to edification. For, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. You know, Christ, it says, look, that let us, you know, please, let us, let each of us please his neighbor for good, leading to edification. We should build up. That's where we get the word edifice from, edification, to build each other up that we should be building each other up, not tearing each other down. Constantly bearing, uh, building each other up, bearing one another burdens, filling the gaps. We're the body. Some are weak and some are strong, but we still are one body. That's the spiritual man to me. When a brother can call you up and say, you know what, last night I fell. Last night I did something that was awful. I used to, God's called me all the time. You know what happened? I, I fornicated yesterday. I said, well, did you confess it to the Lord? Oh, yes, they crying. Oh, yes, I can. I said, now you're telling me? I said, wow, what a wonderful thing you've done. What a wonderful thing. What a courageous thing that you can tell somebody. You told it to the Lord, and now you're bold enough and courageous enough to tell another brother. What a wonderful thing. Now let's pray together. You know, let's pray together. If you're weak, if you struggle with porn, you know, one guy called me, he said, I struggle with porn. I'm struggling. I said, well, how does it all start? He said, well, it starts off this computer. I said, well, I'll be over your house in a few minutes. He said, okay. He said, well, you? I said, I'll be there. I said, I'll be there with my aluminum bat, and we'll fix it. <laughs> you know, he got there. He said, no, don't hit it. Don't, please don't hit my computer. And he, but it's just wonderful when men can tell men, look, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. And because of love and grace and kindness, we can start a flame in a brother's heart. A candle loses nothing by sharing its flame. Because one candle can light a thousand candles. And we could be the ones that say, you know what, brother? Oh, I know you was down then, Lord, but no, God has got you back on track. And he's going to use you, and he's going to use you for his glory. Every man loves to hear that. God's going to use you one day. Every man loves to hear that. You keep obeying the Lord, God's going to use you. And he will use you. And he'll show you the depths of his love in it. He'll show you how Christ was crucified on the cross. And how the cross become this central thing for us. And that, you know, I'm on fire for the Lord because Christ died. He says he's, he was crucified for us. Not, you know, not that he had to go to the cross, but he, he voluntarily laid down his life for all of us sitting here. You know, and I, and I think about how when Christ, you know, he laid down his life. And in not one time when he, when he saw the disciples after his resurrection that he looked them in the eyes and said, you guys, it never says, you ran out on me, you no good rascals. He said, Peter, you love me? Feed my sheep. Tend to my lamb. Not one time did Christ do that. Because he don't bring up our past. 
As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes our transgressions from us. God is a forgiving God. And so all of us, if we're forgiven, if you're here today, you know Christ, you have been forgiven, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That when Christ went to the cross, he paid for your sins in full. And so when we do fall down, we should be the ones that come alongside brothers and say, brother, I'm with you. I'm with you. I know that whole list of things we've gone through earlier, some guys was going like, ouch, ouch. Oh, that's me. That's all right because you're in the right place today. It can be. You can be all of us. Well, you know, good and well, the way they got the internet designed is for men to fall. You can just hit one thing and something to pop up. Like, I wasn't even looking at that. I remember one Sunday, we was at church trying to fix the computer, me and one of the tech guys, and he pushed something, and it was all these naked women came up. We was like, cut that thing off, and this is church. <laughs> we was flipping out. It just, it comes, it comes. I remember this one guy one time, we was doing a Bible study in his house that one of the guys used to teach at, and he was like, he was a funny story because he had, like, when we said, come on down for Bible study. He said, oh, I don't want to be. He said, come on, we love you. We need to be at the Bible study. And then we got into his room. They knocked on the door. They opened his room. He had penthouse photos all in all of his wall. It was his wallpaper. We said, you can't have that and be a Christian. You know what he told us? I did not get baptized yet. I said, well, you're going to wait till you get baptized. Then you're going to take all those nasty pictures down? The thinking sometimes would be so off sometimes. When we come with everything, come with everything. Don't hide. Don't hide stuff. Don't hide where you are today. Don't hide. Don't say, Lord, Lord, you know, I really love you. And then in the back of your mind, you're hiding all these little idols you have. They're hidden. Because God says, look, I want you just like you are. I, I love you just like you are. I want you exactly the way you are. I can't wait till you come and throw this thing now. So now I know I can inflame you in such a way that you are on fire. You got a testimony. You're not a weak testimony. You can say, oh, you know, I struggled with porn. Or I struggled with going to the bar. Or, I struggled with this, Lord. But the Lord has healed me. You know how many men may be healed because of your healing? I struggle with self-centeredness. I struggle with pride. I struggle with greed. And we lay all those things down. We should be that vulnerable. We could say that in the, in the crowd. We should be that vulnerable. Not leave in, go back into your own world. Leave in and say, Lord, change my world that I could be accountable to the body of Christ and other men. Change me, Lord. Because men are falling left and right, left and right, because they say, I don't need no man around me telling me nothing. I don't need nobody to do nothing. There's a verse in Proverbs, write it down if you want to. It's Proverbs 28, 13, and it says that he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Have mercy. Not only that, you'll be fired up. You'll be fired. He says, I don't do that no more. You ever got rid of something and how fired up you became? And passionate about it? But don't use that to look at another man and say, oh, look at you. Look at you. Get it together. No, you're the one that got to use. I experienced so many different things in my life until I think God has used me to do a lot of different things to help people. I just experienced a lot of different things, so I think God can use me to help people. And I sort of kind of understand people. We all are fallen creatures. That's what I understand about people. Even understand the transvestites and stuff. You know, I used to see them when we were little, when we were young, 13, 10, we used to drive our van down there, and they used to see us coming, and they started running. Said, Here they come, run! Because we would bomb them up with old pretzels. We'd, woo, woo, you know. And, and I look back now and I say, you know, we were not good kids. That wasn't nice. <laughs> that wasn't nice, you know. And you think about all the things that the Lord allowed you to see. Now I'm, I'm, I'm so nice to those people. You know, they come in our church, they sit down. 
I don't know what they are sometimes. I don't know if it's a man or a woman. I don't know. I don't even ask. I said, something came in here. <laughs> but I do know. But I do know we can love them. I know that there's a love that God has for them. I know that because of the fruit of the Spirit, we can be kind to them. We can be gentle to them. We could be so fired up that they would be drawn to us. Some of them would, you know, change their lives, come to Christ, and say, Lord, I love you, Jesus. I love you because there was a man there that loved me. There was somebody there that God put there that was on fire for Jesus, and he just loved Jesus so much. And because of the Christ that was in that person, it changed my life. And we have those kind of testimonies in that church. Because we don't have regular people walking there. I don't know what regular people are, but we don't have people could do anything for us. When they walk in that door, we are on the job when they walk through the door. And I realize that homeless men, people that would rob from you, people that bring guns to church, did one guy brought a gun to church one Sunday, he said, you think I should shoot this guy? I said, no, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Don't render evil for evil. He said, thank you. Put the gun away, so I'm gone. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> This really happened, too. I'm not making these stories up. You know, so I know that we need more men to say, Lord, here I am. I'm fired up now. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord, to be used by you. I don't want to play any more phony religious games, Lord. I'm ready. How many of you guys, young, um, 30 and under, raise your hand? God will use y'all guys to be our future, but y'all gotta wear it well. Y'all gotta be the ones that realize what God has for this world. This world looks like it's falling apart, but God is not falling apart. And where sin abounds, grace abounds even the more. And so God is gonna do a greater thing, I believe. These are great times we're living in. I like it when it seems all like hopeless. Oh, look at the legislation. They're legalizing this. They're doing this. Praise the Lord. Yep. <laughs> yes, they are. But what does that have to do with our God? Our God is greater. Don't we sing that song? Awesome in power. We got to believe the words to it. And so look, guys, you're here today and you're saying, Lord, I wish that um, somebody could see my heart from the inside out. I'm so torn up. I'm so broken, my life is just to pieces. I'll have it all together outwardly, but inwardly, my heart is just a mess, Lord. I want to be on fire for you, Lord, but I don't even know where to start. I think the first place to start is, Lord, I just want to put my life in your hands. I just want to turn for whatever displeases you, Lord, as best as I know how. I want to repent, if that's a fancy word. It's the word metanoia in the Greek. It means to change your mind. I want to change my mind about sin. And about the things that I know, Lord, that don't please you and don't bring glory to your name, Lord. And it's evident in my life that these things are fleshly and they're destroying my life. But Lord, now today, today is a, is a day, a turning point in my life. It's a turning point. And I'm coming to you and I'm just coming to you, Lord, by faith. And I don't know what that means, but I'm coming to you. And I think we start with people here that don't know the Lord. But if you don't know the Lord here today, let me tell you something. The greatest thing you need to know is that Jesus loves you. And he never runs out of loving you. And he never runs out of grace. He never runs out of grace. He don't make your life miserable. He'll make your life the best life you ever had because he came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. And so some guys here, they might not know the Lord. They might say, Lord, if this is all real, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. And he's never going to push you away. He's never going to shame you. He's not ashamed of you. And in fact, if you're anything like I was when I came to the Lord, my life was a mess. I remember sitting alone one day, one Saturday, just crying all day. And say, Lord, look at all the time I wasted, all the money I wasted on things that were so-called pleasurable, Lord, but they wasn't pleasurable. I just did them because I didn't know anything better. So look, we're gonna pray in a minute. Let's all stand up. And I wanna do two things. 
If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, right where you're sitting at, that's where I don't want you to walk anywhere because I want, I want to be kind to you. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, this is what I want to do. I want to lead you into a prayer. And this prayer is simply saying, Lord, today I'm giving my life to you, Lord. Surrendering all to you. So I'll lead you into prayer and just repeat after me quietly, or you can say it out loud, but just repeat after me. Let's bow our heads. If you don't know Christ, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life and save me, Lord. I heard you speak to me today, Lord. And I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready to lay my life down and place it in your hand. So, Lord, I turn from my sin today and all I know to be wrong. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he loves me, that he was crucified for me, and he was buried for me, and he rose from the dead on the third day for me. And I have a confidence as I receive you by faith that you will forgive me of all of my sins. I have a confidence today if I receive you by faith that my eternity is in your hand and that heaven will be my eternal home. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for bringing me to this conference today, Lord. Thank you for the joy of being around men who love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now look, if you prayed, you don't know Christ, what I want you to do, I want you to walk down here. Walk across this front, just walk here. And then the second thing I want you to do is um, tell the Lord, Thank you. Say, so, Lord, thank you. Thank you. If you're afraid to walk down, that's fine. Don't walk down. But hit somebody you came with and nudge them and say, look, pray for me. Pray for me. And then the second thing I want to do, this guy's that's been saved for years. Some guys have been walking with the Lord, and somehow you lost that love, that first love it just somehow is not where it was and you saying, you know what today I can look at this and say I am not fired up for the Lord I want to be fired up but different things and life situations have thrown me away and thrown thrown me to a, a different direction and I just started loving money more than I started loving this job or I started loving this car or I started loving this hobby more than I started loving Lord and the Lord and I'm sorry and if you're that man, I want you to just raise your hand. Just raise your hand where you're at. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand up high. Don't be ashamed. We're all brothers here. I can raise my hand up twice. I'm sure I lost. Just raise your hand. Let me pray for these guys. Father, Lord, you know, Lord, that, Lord, this journey, Lord, is, was meant to walk with you, that it was a journey that we would always include you in it, Lord, and that we would allow you to lead us. And so, Father, Lord, I pray for those who raised their hands, Lord, and those who was ashamed to raise their hands, Lord, because uh, they may have been concerned about well, how people viewed them or think, think about them, but, Lord, that doesn't really matter in your sight, Lord. You love us despite ourselves. But, Lord, I pray for those, Lord, who really want their lives changed, they really want something new to happen in their hearts. That they realize that life is but a vapor, life is short and years and gone by and they realize that some of the things they could have been or could have done will have never come to fruition in their lives. And so Father, I pray, Lord, even now, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you come upon this place, come upon our hearts, Lord, and forgive us of all of our sins. Forgive us of all the things that we've done, Lord, that's not like you. 
Lord, forgive us for being complacent, Lord, and being, Lord, sometime, Lord, just not in tune with what the Spirit wants to do in our life. Lord, forgive us, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you on what you're going to do in this church, Lord. We thank you for how, Lord, you're going to raise up guys, Lord, who, Lord, will never be professional conference goers, but, Lord, they would be men, Lord, when they leave places, Lord, that they say, I want to change the world. I want to change the world. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, right now, Lord, that you raise up those souls, those who have a heart after you, Lord, a heart like David, a heart like Paul, a heart like those, Timothy, Lord, that would want to serve you with their whole hearts. So, Father, we know that you are an awesome God. We know that you're a caring shepherd, Lord, and we thank you for laying our lives into your hand, Lord. We trust you, and we believe in you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.